Hey guys, ML here. So, you know, I don't endorse a lot of products for beauty. I do a lot of fashion, a lot of jewelry because I can try it on, no worries. But with makeup, it's a lot harder. So I found this wonderful product or brand called Pharmacy. It's all natural, vegan approved. Everything comes from farm life. Everything I see on my face today, eyeshadow, uh, mascara, lipsticks, it's all from the Pharmacy brand. And this is so, so important for me because my skin is horrible at not tolerating different types of makeup. This is a brand I can actually wear for 18 hours, not touch up anything, and have zero reaction to it. My skin is that sensitive that I have a reaction to everything, and I don't with this. So if you're like me, hey, try it out. It's on pharmacy. And if you're watching this or listening to it, the actual link is in the comment section. Thank you. Dove and Dragon Radio. I'm your host, Emma Rieschak. I'm here with my special guest, Anikia Kabiri. Welcome. Nika. Hi. See, I'm going to virtue you your name. <laughs> how many times I try to say it correctly? I am a the one person that butchers names regardless. You're not the only one. <laughs> it happens all the time. I wanted this uh, Starbucks name. But yeah. Yeah. So you are a consulting business. What actually do you do? You have a lot of things on your site. I'm like, okay, it's information overload. I'm going to have you explain it. Yeah. Um, so I do, I basically do decision science. That's what I tell people that I do. And where, however it applies, um, I basically do it. On the business side, my consultancy is really just all about helping businesses make better decisions. Um, and I do this through getting the right information for them, doing the right research, but also looking into like um, behavioral economics literature or research and sociology to understand how people make purchasing decisions, um, how consumers buy stuff so more businesses can sell more stuff basically. And then I also have a website called yournextdecision.com and it's just a content site. And that's where I offer advice or tips on how to make better decisions to just everyday people, excuse me, everyday people. Um, and that's, those are, those are my two big things. Um, that's where I've kind of put my heart mostly. So which I, helping people is what we do. If we yeah. don't help people, we don't feel fulfilled. This is why we offer services for people. <laughs> uh, but exactly. consulting, doing it this way, you have the business side. So if you look, just look at the business. And as a business owner, this is broken down for me. So I don't have to do all the thinking. So this is why I go to people like you. I don't want to yeah. think. But I need to know as a business owner where people are spending money, how they're making decisions, how to market my products and this is what you're telling them how to do it yeah pretty much and for every category or every type of business so a lot of my clients are in tech but they do different things in tech mm -hmm. um they are a smart oven they are a fitness a tracker. They might be um, a Wi-Fi mesh system. Um, so whatever they are, their consumers are going to look for things, specific things and think in specific ways about what to buy because they're evaluating different things when you're value, you know, when you're looking at different products, you're thinking and evaluating about different things, but also humans are people like, like <laughs> sounds kind of obvious We're we're going to do what we do as humans um, pretty much across the board. There's some general principles that are, that are true whatever you're buying or whatever you're trying to decide. And so those kind of things kind of cross across, you know, across all different categories and industries, but yeah. Pretty much human is a human. Human if is a human. <laughs> if you go to the, oh, this makes me feel good. A human's going to buy it. <laughs> More or less. 
That is the basic principle. Make it pretty, people will buy it. If it doesn't look pretty, it doesn't make them feel good. They don't want it. Yeah, that's a really great point too, because a lot of times businesses think that consumers are weighing pros and cons rationally, but a lot of purchase decisions aren't aren't rational at all. It's a lot about feeling and gut and Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We like to pretend we're rational when we buy stuff. Not all the time, not usually. No, my daughter will be the one that goes to your product labels. What do you have in the product? Uh, what brand is this? How much does it cost? And she's very right. analytical like this, but she's also autistic. So I don't expect- There you, you know, go. Yeah. The normal person will not look at a product label for, you know, just to see what product's in it. Right. Or they will, but then if it feels good in another way, they'll ignore the product label. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. So I mean, I don't do, I have two pairs of sneakers here. One is by brand A that everyone knows. One is probably brand B that no one knows, a store brand. They both feel the same. One's cheaper than the other. What am I going to do? I'm going to do what makes sense for my money. Right. And a lot of the work that I do is really about trying to understand like how different people make different decisions. So, So some people are more price sensitive because they don't have you know, they don't make as much money. And so their considerations are going to be different than people who are not really sensitive to price or um, families like parents make very different purchase decisions than single people. Age has a lot to do with it. So a lot of what I do is just looking at how these different variables impact decisions, but keeping in mind that we are all using some bias, we're all using some emotion, we're all impulsive in some way. Um, no matter what our age or our income bracket. Oh, no, we all have those impulses. Oh, look, it's shiny, it's pretty. I got to have it. Yeah, yeah, it happens. It happens to me every day. I, I mean, you put me in a jewelry store, it's shiny, it's pretty, I want it. <laughs> you right. put me in a tire store, I'm going to go, okay. Right, what do I do? Uh, yeah, <laughs> but that's how people yeah. make decisions. It's going to depend on your demographics and people don't understand demographics is more than just one yeah. part. There is age, uh, income, uh, how you're brought up. It goes to tons of different mindsets in one little demographic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and these days politics could even play a role. You know, there are a lot of things that are going on that, you know, determine what we, what we buy and what we don't, don't buy. And a lot of it, a lot of what I try to help my clients do is to turn the tire and make the tire shiny and pretty, you know, how do you make something that's boring, exciting mm-hmm. so that people will want to buy it? Right. Um, yeah. It's, how it's, do you take uh, a screwdriver? That's, you know, a screwdriver is a screwdriver is a screwdriver. How do you make this one stand out from this one over here? Oh, it's so important. That is something that's a really great, great point, because that's something a lot of businesses don't think about is how different you really have to be, like how unique you have to be, because in order for someone to first choose you, you have to be noticeable. Mm -hmm. And if you are like every other screwdriver, or I think bottled water is this way, like if you're just like every other bottled water, then why do you stand out? Like, why would anybody want you? And that's where branding comes in. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you brand yourself? What's your story? What's your identity? What's your brand personality? Um, I think a lot of people buy particular water is water, arguably, but some people buy Dasani because it's got some sort of special feeling to it. Whereas other people will just go for the cheaper brand. You know, it's the branding is pretty important. Right. It, you have to look at branding. You have to mark, do marketing. You have to nowadays with social media, get your social media influencers involved. Yeah. Because yep. a good social media marketer can sell bottled water to anyone for anything or yes. sell ice to an Eskimo. Totally. And that's where influencers really matter because influencers become a voice of the brand. If you get the right influencer to stand for your brand, then you're really kind of buying the influencer's vouch or you're like kind of buying the influencer more than you are buying the product. So if you pick the right influencer that matches with your brand personality and you have the right, they have the right audience, then it can all really work together well. But also with this, you have to be very careful because you don't want someone that's not authentic. Right. Seeing the voice of your brand. 
You know, authenticity is such an interesting topic because I think more and more because of social media, Mm -hmm. people, especially younger people are kind of aware they're cluing in to what's not authentic and Mm -hmm. they don't really like it. They don't want to be sold to, they don't want fake. So absolutely right. Like the more genuine, it seems the more authentic it is. Um, it's, you know, it's a completely different age of marketing these days. It is. I mean, as a social media marketer, I will try a product. If I cannot try that product and know I can stand behind it, I will not endorse it. That's me. Now, I don't care how much you're paying me, but I'm not going to endorse a product. I, I can't stand behind it. Can I ask you a question about that? Yes. Is it for ethical reasons or do you feel like you just can't pull it off? If you I cannot it? pull off something that I cannot okay. stand behind. It would feel like a lie to me. And if it's a lie for myself to put it out there, right? I can't do it. As a business owner, I don't want someone that has to lie for my brand to be the voice of my brand. So True. why would I do it for a brand? That's true. You know, I, I wonder, there are a lot of businesses who probably would not care about that. I think about that a lot. Like a lot mm-hmm. of businesses who, who just want to grow the bottom line and they don't care how authentic their influencers yeah. are or what else they might do to do that. Um, it's a really interesting kind of question. What drives some businesses to, to go one way versus the other, like what, dis, what decision-making is going on there. And I suspect it's a lot of, a lot of bandwagoning, like, you know, yeah, a lot of, if you get to the bigger companies, everyone knows the company. So they don't care if the influencer yeah. is authentic or if they have to pay them buku money to pretend to be authentic. Right. They don't care. It's getting the name that the biggest star you can think of to endorse the product. Right. At that point, it's just, here's money. We're going to make it back anyways. Right. When you have a smaller business. Totally. You can't think like that. Money makes you money provides options. It really does. That's Mm -hmm. really, I think the benefit of money, whether you're a business or a person, it just buys you options and it, it makes things easier because you have more choices. You can have, you can do more things. Yeah. We say money doesn't matter, but technically it does. It does. It totally does. And your decision-making changes with the more money you have. Very true. Very but true. if you have all the money in the world and you still think with the small business mindset with your money, then you make more rational decisions. <sighs> Gosh, uh, don't get me started on this subject because I have worked with more than one client who has grown, like, you know, started as a small company startup and has just grown and they still hang on to this small company mindset, like, Mm -hmm. you know, a shoestring budget when they have a lot of investment dollars poured into the company, or we have to be scrappy when you really don't. Um, And also a lot of um, decisions that, that larger companies make are kind of constrained by their, the way they organize their company. And, you know, when you're a startup or a smaller company, um, it's like just a, a few people that are just doing whatever it takes, right? You're kind of all a team, you're all on the same level. There isn't a lot of hierarchy or, and then as companies grow, there has to be more structure. There has to right. be like more of an organization. And some companies, as they grow, some CEOs are afraid to do that because they don't want to lose the homey feel of the small company And they think that's what attracts a lot of people to work at the company, which it kind of does, but I don't think it really works. I think you have to kind of grow up as a company and mature, develop not just in culture or in the products you sell or anything like that, but just in the your organizational structure, like being more. You can have your company run behind the scenes as a major corporation with that mindset, but still keep your products true to the small business. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Your, your message, your, yeah, you can still come across as a small kind of homey business, but yeah, under the, under the hood, why can't you function more like you are, which is a bigger business, right? You look at, okay. Google, Google is owned by another corporation The right. actually, you know, behind the scenes, how right. that corporation is structured. We don't see that. Nope. We don't, we well, don't care. We don't care. 
we know Google, we know the Google products. We right. know a brand that we trust, mostly trust, <laughs> but we know this brand. Trust enough. Yet trust enough, yeah. but yeah. we know this. We yeah. don't know the corporation that owns them. We have no idea how a uh, wizard behind the curtain operates. We don't care. We don't need to know this. This is the same principle when you start up as a small business and you grow into a corporation. You don't right. need your clients, your customers to know what's going on behind the curtain. Nope. You just have to be really good at persuading them to, to pick up what you're putting down. Yeah. Basically. And it's, and a lot of the same techniques that, that a company should use to do that are techniques that people can use in their daily lives to be persuasive. Like there's just a lot of similarities because really when, when we, and this is really, I think topical because there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of polarization. Like people are believing a lot of different things out there in the world. Yes. And a lot of people are trying to persuade one another to come to their camp, like come and, you know, get the vaccine. No, the vaccine yes. or, um, and in order to, to kind of really persuade someone to believe in QAnon or abandon QAnon, whichever side you're on, mm -hmm. you have to employ certain tactics that, um, that are really relationship oriented. Like you're really having to, you really have to build relationships because you can't convince someone to change their firmly held beliefs just because your facts are better, that it doesn't really work that way. And I think a lot of people can attest to the fact that just by spitting out facts about the effectiveness of the COVID vaccine is not going to change a lot of people's minds about that. Um, relationship building kind of does a lot more for that because we believe who we're close to. We believe who we're connected to because if we don't know them, we don't trust them. And if we right. can't trust them, we can't believe them. And companies have to do the same thing. Um, right. They have to be trustworthy. They have to build that connection, that relationship. Um, you have and to have your marketers, your faces, be people that the community trusts. If you do right. not have the trust within your community, you, regardless of what your message is, it's going to not be heard. This not does not heard. matter if it's vaccines, polarization, and politics. It doesn't matter if you're selling something. It doesn't matter if you're trying to get mom and dad to give you an allowance raise. Right. If, <laughs> seriously, my daughter has used friends to try to get her <laughs> a raise and her allowance. But oh, wow. This, this is my daughter. She's very good. <laughs> but... You but, raised um, her. You raised her well. You raised her to be smart. That's probably what it is. It's not, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to argue my case for me. I'm going to have my friend over my here friend argue it. my case. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. It depends it. on what the cause is. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. You have to, you can't use, it's not a one size fits all way of going about it. You kind of have to read the situation. Yes. Um, but relationship building is such an important part of persuasion. And um, I recently put a guide on my website on trying to, um, I, I call it trying to change or a misinformed mind, like trying to convince someone who believes in misinformation, whatever, however you want to define that, that I'm leaving up to the reader, mm -hmm. um, how to persuade them. And, um, and, and the, the crux of that, of my argument is definitely that, like you have to start with that connection, that human connection, because if you don't, right. Um, yeah. How many of our politicians would be politicians today if they didn't have a connection within their community? Right. Or if they can't, I mean, you have to have the charisma to build a connection, even though you're a stranger to people to have that kind of, kind of, and celebrities do this too. Like some celebrities, we just feel like we know, yes. like we just feel like we know them because they have a way of coming across as being very accessible and personable and politicians that do that pretty effective too. strangers to us, but we feel like they're not, if you yes. can pull that off, that's pretty effective. And those are the ones that you go to because those are the ones we look up to. Yes. Because they can pull that off. Exactly. We trust them. Yes. It's all building trust within your community. Your community doesn't have to be the neighborhood you grew up in. It could be your state, city, state, you know, whatever. Right. But it's, building that sense of community. If you can't build a sense of community for your product or you're you know, trying to get a fundraiser up the street for your church or whatever you're doing, you cannot 
pulling something off. You have to go back to basics. Totally. Totally. It is. It's all social human, like the basics of human thinking, the basics of humans interaction. It's the same things that we've been doing as people for how many years we've been around. Right. Um, we're still employing those same things to know what to believe, who to trust, what choices to make, everything from what to buy to who to vote for, to, you know, whether to get a vaccine, whatever it is. Um, it's all coming back to you. Who do we know? Who do we trust? What inform, where are we getting our information? Do we trust it? Um, and sometimes if we know someone, trust someone, the dangerous part is that they can say anything and we might believe it too. Like, um, <laughs> there's a really funny comedy skit. I think Tom Segura is the, is the comedian who, who, um, has this bit, but he talks about how his dad just told him one day that, um, I think it was Tom Selleck some celebrity was gay. And Tom Segura, the, the comedian is like, well, I just believed it because it was my dad. And for years I believed it because it was my dad and I didn't really question it. And it turns out it was totally wrong. And all these years I was going around telling everyone that the celebrity was not who he was. And um, and all you, know, all you have to do sometimes is fact check, fact check it. But if you really trust someone, you can just go with whatever. Um, and then you have you to kind of double check your fact checkers. Yeah. yeah. How many times? Are fact checkers actually politically or polarized, you know, to give you the misinformation. So it comes across as they're giving you the right information when it's actually wrong. We see kind this, the, especially in business. Just because a fact checker says one thing, you cannot always trust it. You still have to go to three or four or five different fact checkers to check your facts. Yep. That's why I read four or five different newspapers or news accounts of the same story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You don't just, you can't just trust what you hear on the radio or what you see on TV or what you read in one news. Yeah, source. If, yeah. if I'm talking politics, right. you have to go to, and I did this with history with my daughter growing up. You have to go to five different sources. Yeah. Just not to be safe. just CNN and Fox. You have to go to actually outside of the country to fact check your in-country news. I, I think that's a really smart idea to go to foreign news. Absolutely. I did this when I was doing history because I'm big on history with my daughter when we did Revolutionary War. Okay, that's history. That's what passed. But mm -hmm. I went to the British side, the American side, and the Native American side from both sides. Now. That's a 360 view right there. Now there's a 360. Now you have your facts in order. Now you I have applied your this strategy to business. Right, right. So the one wonder, so I, I wonder this all the time, I'm going to ask you, why don't more businesses do that? They want the easy way. Yeah, yeah. It comes down to money, time, and what's the easy? Just because it's easy doesn't mean it's right. No, no, not at all. The easiest decision right. goes with the grain. If you go in with the grain, now you're not being the company you want to be. You're doing exactly what people before you have laid out. Yeah. If you disrupt the grain, and we see this with Tesla a lot, it goes against the grain, but it works. Why does it right. work? One is different. Two, they have great marketing. And their marketing isn't marketing, it's word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And three, they don't do anything within the media mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. why they're disrupting everything yeah you have to disrupt the market that you're trying to get in right right they also have a product or a set of products that actually work like you have to have good products i think a lot of businesses forget this too they put a lot into the frills and the marketing and the branding but, but at the end of the day i mean what's that maxim the worst thing of uh that that a marketer can do is start with a bad product or the worst thing that could happen to a marketing campaign is having a bad product. Like you don't mm -hmm. want a lot of people to come to your business and then sell them something you can't, that you couldn't promise, like deliver something that you couldn't really, that you couldn't, that doesn't live up to, to the promise. Correct. I mean, Tesla does this really well. They have really good product. I mean, yeah, there's some bad issues with some of their tech and stuff and they're working on it. But at the same time, they have a really good product. If you have a really yeah. good product, the marketing and word of mouth is more than just. It's more than a it's fad. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I think, I think a lot of businesses want to be the fad, but it's not good to be a fad. It's not good. There's mm-hmm. no staying power in that. No, fads go away. You have to be something that's sustainable. Yeah. You do not want to be a fad. You do not want your product to be something that's poor quality. You do not right. want your customer service to start out with great customer service. I used to love my customer service for my phone and then I switched and now I hate it. So I got rid of the service because I don't like the customer service. Yep. So important. It's so important. So I mean, it's all, fun. yeah, it all goes to how your mindset is and why you have people like you to tell us as business owners, how yeah. to look for this stuff. Right. Right. I also find that a lot of what I do isn't really mind, like it's not mind shattering. Mm-hmm. I think it's not so much that I tell or advise people to do things that they'd never heard of before or never thought of before. I think the thing is that we're all sucked into a lot of our biases um, and we lose sight of being rational decision makers. So if we having a very calm, collected conversation like we are right now, we it makes a lot of sense what we have to do. We can lay it all out. And this, here's the blueprint for running a decent business. But when you're in the stress of it and in the moment of making those decisions, even the smartest, well, most well-intentioned, rational people start to, you know, follow the bandwagon, mm-hmm. um, employ confirmation bias, where they only look at data that supports what they already believe, as opposed to like making decisions based on the right data. Um, overconfidence bias. They think they know, oh, I know what people want. And they just kind of, there's no evidence to suggest they do. There are all these different ways in which I've seen business leaders go wrong for no other reason than they're human. They're doing all these things, the human glitches that we have. Um, and a lot of my job is just to sort of set them. On. It's like, oh yeah, remember that's, that's a bias. And I got to set, you got to go this way. Um, you do, you, you have yeah. to ch- put yourself in check. That's why we're supposed to in our, um, in the corporate world, you have board members or in the small business world, you have business partners that are yeah. supposed to be there to keep you in check. Yeah. And I, I, I do this with coaching my personal clients too. Mm-hmm. Like people who come to me with two job offers, which do I take? Um, this guy I've been dating, should I dump? I mean, just random all over the board kind of coaching questions that people have mm-hmm. where they involve, it involves really good decision-making in their personal lives. And ultimately they all know to some extent, not in their gut. I don't think they're really saying they know in their gut what's right, but people do weigh the pros and cons. They do think rationally, but then the stress of it and all of that other stuff happens or their friends say something or their parents says something. And and then all of these other things that they believe were right just sort of fall apart. Rational thinking goes away. And again, like all I really do is say, whoa, wait a minute. Um, There's a group think going on here, whatever the the issue might be, you might want to slow down a bit and and rethink what, you know, what the plan was, what was the plan? Let's, let's stick to the plan. I I mean, we do this with our families, Mm -hmm. especially when you have siblings Mm -hmm. and I have a lot of siblings. So going from the wait, let me step back and look at this from an outsider's perspective and go, okay, here's my thoughts as an outsider. Now let me step back into the thick of this and go yeah. from the, okay, I'm one of you. Let me look at it the different way and go, it's two different mindsets. And yeah. it's hard to not go with the grain when you see your relatives. Yeah. It's really, really hard. It's really but- hard. It is. It is really hard. But at the same time, sometimes you have to be that disruptive family member. You do. I mean, there's actual research on this, you know, academics have done research on the impact of, there's one research study I read about um, college kids, kids choosing their majors, and many of them are influenced by their parents mm-hmm. regarding which major to choose. And those kids are much less happy in their college experience. Um, because they're not making their own decisions and they're being influenced by what their parents think they should do. And it happens every day, every day. The best decision I ever made was to stop listening to my family. (laughs) Yes. That is the best decision. That's when I started being happy. So am I, am I allowed to ask personal question? Yes. What, when, what was the moment? Like, what was the moment where you were like, okay, I can't do this anymore. I got to do it. I got to do it my own way. Was it a breaking point moment or was it just kind of a lot? Oh, no, it was a breaking point moment. It was, I was in a marriage. 
my family was saying the one thing uh-huh. I was getting my spouse was saying something neither part was making me happy so I said okay I'm going to do this my way and I walked away from everything oh wow were you scared yes I think that's what keeps people from doing, from making the right decision. A lot of times is the fear. If the fear, you're not afraid of what you're doing, you're dreaming too small. Mm-hmm. And I think it was Elon Musk that said that. Yeah. If your dreams don't scare you, quote. your dreaming, dreaming's too small. Too I think small. that's a full pro quote. That's true. That's true. It's a fear of the unknown mm-hmm. that keeps us back. I think we can Once. handle the unknown a lot better than we think we can, most of us. Exactly. If you go back to my radio show three years ago, mm-hmm. four years ago, it was just radio. It was very quiet, very timid. Now you see me today on video, and I'm always on video, and I'm very vocal about everything, regardless of what the guest has to say. I'm vocal on their yeah. product. And it makes for great conversation. It does. If I'm quiet, yeah. If I'm quiet and not engaging in my guests, how am I running my business? Well, I'm not. Yeah. If I can't engage one person, how can I engage a hundred? Yep. 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 As a business owner, that's the mindset you need. That's true. That's true. But we are almost out of time. So where can our yeah. listeners and our viewers find you? Yeah. So, um, you can go to my website. It's your next decision.com. Um, I have advice column on there. I have some guides to help you make decisions and you can learn about me there too. Awesome. It's your next decision.com. Awesome. It's so great having you on the show today. Oh, it's great to be here. I love talking with you. Thank you so much. And for all of our viewers and our listeners, happy listening.